Hello, my name is Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. Thank you for having an interest in this critically important topic of vaccines, and welcome to the video, Vaccines, the Risk, the Benefits, the Choices. As a practicing physician who is board certified in two medical specialties, emergency medicine and osteopathic manual medicine, it was difficult for me to change my views about vaccination. Like every other physician, I was taught that vaccines are safe and effective and important for keeping us healthy. However, after more than 6,000 hours of intensive investigation, I have found that much of what I was taught is based on assumptions and medical dogma that has simply been passed on from one physician to another, one generation to another, without a thorough examination of the science at hand. When it comes to the topic of vaccines, most people, doctors and parents alike, have an existing belief that vaccines are necessary. We believe that vaccines are safe and effective. We trust that they will protect us and our children from infections thought to be deadly. When we are told to vaccinate our children, we subject them to the medical procedure without much additional thought. It rarely occurs to us to challenge these long-held beliefs or to question whether the premise of injecting bits of bacteria and viruses into our body is really the best and only way to keep us healthy. The material you are about to see will present information that will seriously challenge your beliefs about vaccines. The information has been taken directly from scientific journals and from documents written by the Centers for Disease Control, the nation's most authoritative body licensing and mandating the use of vaccines. It is time that we begin to seriously question vaccination. Are low infection rates an acceptable trade-off for long-term immune system disruption and the very real possibility of poor health? Since you are taking your valuable time to investigate this issue, my sincere hope is that you will gain the knowledge and confidence you need to make an informed decision about one of the most important choices you will ever make that will impact your health, vaccination. Well, good morning, and thank you all for coming. My name is Dr. Sherry Tempenny, and I want, I want to welcome you to the presentation that we're going to do this morning called Vaccines, the Benefits, the Risks, and the Choices. Now, we all know that vaccines have been touted to be the most important medical discovery that's ever happened to our planet and to our medical industry for the last couple hundred years. And some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning are, are you're probably going to find to be not only um, different from that paradigm, but disquieting and even a little bit upsetting at times. Um, because these are things not normally talked about in the medical world. Uh, in fact, I would venture to say that a lot of physicians don't even know this information. Um, I've spent the last three or four years investigating this on my own, and I stopped counting, literally counting the hours of, of um, the time that I've um, in, put into this investigation at about 5,000 hours. And I think I've probably gone about 1,000 hours since then because I do dedicate somewhere between two to four hours a day, almost every day of the week, to investigating this very moving target because of all the things that are constantly happening inside the vaccine industry. Not only the changes of the individual vaccines, but the things that are happening in the bioterrorism world now, things that are happening in politics, things that are happening in new discoveries. So there's an awful lot of things to know about. What we're going to be focusing on today and spending the better part of about two and a half hours discussing are all the individual pediatric vaccines. Um, after we go through those, we're going to talk about the meningitis vaccine that has to do with the college-age kids. Um, we're going to talk about RSV and that what that vaccine is to newborns. We're going to talk a little bit more about what's planned for newborn vaccination here over the next couple of years. And then we'll, at the, we'll conclude at the end talking about um, travel vaccines. 
There will be some information in here about exemptions. Um, there'll be some information about what you can do politically to get involved with this. Um, so we've got a whole lot of things to cover. And without further ado, we'll just go ahead and say, this is what the CDC and what the uh, conventional medical world has to say about vaccines. That they say that vaccines are among the nation's most important public health tools. They save lives and money, protect people, particularly infants and young children, from unnecessary suffering caused by vaccine-preventable diseases, and improve the quality of life for infants, children, adolescents, and adults. Since the introduction of safe and effective vaccines, the United States and most developed countries have experienced at least a 97% reduction in the number of cases of vaccine-preventable diseases of childhood compared to pre-vaccine era levels. Reported cases of vaccine-preventable diseases in children are currently at record low levels. However, these diseases can readily return if immunization levels decline as a result of complacency or other factors. Now, we're going to go through in a good portion of this video and refute a lot of those statements. Um, there's another veil, uh, uh, video that's available that I've done. It's called uh, about the CDC's information. It's called um, what the CDC and science documents reveal. And it will go through much more specific reasons about the safety and efficacy issues. This one today, we're going to focus on what's happening with the individual vaccines. Now, one of the things that you'll notice as we go through this entire presentation is these documentations down here at the bottom, where it says cdc.gov. All of those are CDC website documents. When I first got involved in this information, <laughs> I decided that Gosh, there were an awful lot of people saying that vaccines weren't good for you and they were causing harm and they were causing an awful lot of problems. Maybe the place to start this investigation would go to the CDC's website and look at all the things that the CDC says as to why vaccines are good, why they protect you, why there are all those things in that first introductory statement that I just read. Well, the CDC being the Center for Disease Control, they're the ones who are the, the, the make the rules and make the laws and to pass the legislation and make the approval to the committees to pass the vaccines and put them into the, the pediatric schedule. It's sort of like if you were an attorney and you wanted to investigate some sort of issue, you would probably go to the U.S. Supreme Court. You would want to go to the highest law in the land and look and see what those case things were. Well, I wanted to go to the highest law in the land in terms of the vaccine world, and so I went to the CDC's website and started reading all of their materials. And once I started started reading their materials, I realized that there were a lot of discrepancies and an awful lot of things that nobody really thinks about. And that's where a lot of this material comes from. The other part of the material comes from uh, conventional medical journals, such as the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, JAMA, which is the Journal for American Medical Society. Um, those types of, of journals have supporting documentation. The Journal of the Auto, Autoimmunity, the Journal of Immunology, when we start talking about autoimmune issues. So all of this material is available to the conventional medical world and conventional medical doctors. It's just kind of what we call hidden in plain sight. Nobody's really reading it, and so therefore it's claimed that it's not there. So this is the thing that ends up happening when you start questioning vaccination and start questioning whether or not this is a good thing for you and your family. <clears throat> These are the sorts of statements that get read. That anti-vaccine con consumers, you know, as soon as you start questioning, you start getting labeled as an anti-something. So this is being, we're being labeled as anti-vaccine. So anti-vaccine consumers tend to be those with a child who had a bad reaction, which of course could have been a coincidence. Those who believe the government should not tell them what to do, which I believe in a free society, there's some truth to that one. It, uh, and those who are increasingly focused on perceived benefits of alternative medicine. Well, for those of us who know the actual benefits of alternative medicine, we say that there's something more than just a perception. So these are some statements that have, this has been around for a long time. This was a, a, a quote that I got out of Family Practice News way back in 1999. But it doesn't change much, that we are considered to be anti-vaccine consumers because of all these coincidences and that there are, is no proof. And we're going to show, that, show you that there is quite a bit of proof. So we have a very large public health policy here. Um, the vaccine industry in this country alone is somewhere between 7 and $10 billion a year. Um, so because we do this, and it's part of our public health policy, part of our school policy, there has to be some basic assumptions upon which that is built. Well, after ferreting down all this information and, and sort of sifting through it, I've come up with at least four reasons why we have this policy. One is that vaccines, we believe that vaccines are responsible for the decline of infectious diseases. We believe that they are solely responsible, and that is the cornerstone of what this is all about. That if we were able to vaccinate away smallpox and soon to be polio, then we can vaccinate away just about any other type of infectious disease on the planet. 
Vaccines are believed to be safe and relatively harmless. Well, there are a whole lot of safety and, effic and, and harm issues that need to be discussed. We don't go into that very much in depth in this particular presentation, but the other video says, spends a lot of time talking about that. That vaccines are effective and the effects are long-lasting. Well, it all depends on how you define effective. Most parents and physicians would define effective to mean that it protects you. From a scientific perspective, what research shows is that what effective means when you're doing a vaccine study means I inject something in you and you, it effectively causes the, the development of an antibody. Does that antibody necessarily protect you? There's a lot of discussion about whether or not that's, that's, that's an absolute truth. And that vaccines are the only way to prevent epidemics of these dangerous diseases. I mean, really dangerous things like mumps and chicken pox, you know. We've got some really bad things. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some dangerous diseases out there, and that's not to minimize the effect of that some of these, these um, illnesses can cause some serious problems. But the overall, when you stand back and put it in perspective of what everything is about, that's what we're here to talk about today. <clears throat> So we're going to start with some definitions because words have power and words have meaning. And I think that if you use the right words with this, you'll begin to get a different perspective of what this is all about. For one thing, we're going to talk about the definition between vaccination and immunization because they're not synonyms. <clears throat> what vaccination means, it's the physical act of giving a shot. And what immunization means, it's the process that happens inside of your physiology to try to induce an artificial immunity. So when you say, I want to take, I'm going to take my kids to the doctor and get them immunized, you're really not. All you're really doing is taking them to the doctor to get them vaccinated. You're taking them over there to get them a shot. Whether or not they develop an immunity remains to be seen. And even the CDC says that, that although persons use vaccination and immunization interchangeably, the terms are not synonyms. The administration of a shot or a vaccine cannot automatically be equated with the development of immunity. Well, that's their own material. I mean, that's a direct quote that comes from this MMWR. And whenever you see MMWR, that stands for Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Just put that into your brain that that's a government document. So whenever you see MMWR in any of these references or any of these footnotes, that means that, that that is a quote or that is a reference that came directly from the government document, uh, the CDC documents. And, that you've, and please feel free, uh, all of these slides are documented so that you can go and, and do your own investigation and look these things up yourself. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this first assumption, that vaccines are the primary reason for the dramatic decline of infectious diseases, primary reason being the operative word there, because that's what the focus is on. And it doesn't matter if you pick up a CDC document, if you pick up an, uh, a medical journal, if you pick up the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the, or the Cleveland Plain Dealer, if there's an article in there about vaccines, somewhere in the first couple of sentences or the first paragraph, they talk about the decline of diseases because of vaccines. There, in some instances, there is some, there is some truth to that. But there's a whole bigger process in terms of declining of the infectious diseases that we need to take a look at. The first in the cornerstone, and, we, and I'm going to spend some time talking about smallpox and polio, primarily because as a new parent or somebody that's just getting involved in this um, issue or starting to investigate it, this is always the place from which it starts. And if you talk to conventional medical doctors or pediatricians or anybody out in the field, this is the cornerstone thing, that if we vaccinated smallpox into, uh, into oblivion, we can do that with any other type of vaccine. So I think it's important for you to have an understanding of the smallpox vaccination and the smallpox program to sort of understand the, that cornerstone argument and where it has some holes. The other thing is that the smallpox program is not going to go away, and we're going to spend a few extra minutes talking about that. But first, we're going to start with the past. We just go a little bit of a small history of the smallpox vaccine. It was in 1796 that Edward Jenner demonstrated that skin inoculated with cowpox, and that's not smallpox, but cowpox, provided some, some protection against what was perceived to be a smallpox infection. In the 1800s, it was the first reported case of smallpox vaccination here in the United States. And by the 1940s, Okay, that was 140 years later. They had figured out a way to commercially manufacture this. A couple years later, the Pan American uh, San, uh, Sanitary Organization initiated a worldwide eradication program. And then by 1970, worldwide vaccination program had been going on for more than 100 years, but it was still failing. There were huge outbreaks that were still going on. And for example, 
outbreaks were happening in India with an 80, greater than an 88% vaccination rate. And most of the CDC's materials say that if the vaccination rate is above 85%, that should control epidemics and outbreaks. Well, we've been doing this now for almost 200 years, and we still hadn't eradicated smallpox. It was going away, but it really hadn't been vaccinated away. And there are some materials that suggest that worldwide, at any given time, uh, over the entire world, while they were undergoing this vaccination process, only approximately 10% of the worldwide population ever received a smallpox vaccine. So it wasn't that every single human being on the planet ever had the vaccine. Other things were happening to make it go away. So because it really wasn't working, and they were still having these epidemics and these outbreaks in these in third world country indigenous areas, the CDC decided to change their strategy. So in 1972, what they decided to do was they developed a program called Surveillance and Containment which what they would do is they would go into these third world country in these villages, mostly in um, northern India and China and various countries in, Af in Africa, and they would actively seek out people that had smallpox. And what they would do is once they would find someone that had an outbreak of smallpox, they would isolate them or quarantine them, and that they would do something called ring vaccination. So they'd take the whole family and put it in the house or the hut or wherever living conditions that they had, and they would vaccinate all the family members and all their close contacts. Now, once they started doing that, the outbreaks really stopped within about four years. And on October 26, 1997, is what is reported to be the last naturally occurring case of smallpox in, in Somalia. A few years later, in 1980, the World Health Organization announced that, the, that smallpox had been eradicated. There was a, a, a physician and a researcher named Dr. Tom Mack, who was from the University of Southern California, that was at the CDC meeting in June of 2002, which I actually was there and presented a, um, an argument as to why we should not do mass vaccination of the smallpox vaccine that was as they were revving that up after 9-11. And so I went